Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you to uh, Dr. Lee and all the wonderful colleagues here at ICAK Korea. I think this is my fourth visit to Korea over many, many years, and my third in the last couple of years. And uh, I have to say, like everybody, we are so impressed and so in admiration of your chapter and the warm and uh, heartfelt welcome that we've received here. And so I, I'd like to thank uh, all those involved in looking after us uh, so, so well. And also, we should perhaps thank the unsung work of the great translators. Thank you in the box there. I'll try to remember to speak clearly and slowly. So what I want to talk to you about today is the work that uh, we've been doing in the UK and a bit in Germany, um, helping children w with learning difficulties. Um, here we are coming from Oxford where I live. Um, findings suggest that mental disorders and physical dis diseases often co-occur in children. Um, and this is a big public health challenge in many ways. Um, and so your title here is the wider vision. So this is another angle of the wider way in which AK can facilitate change uh, in these children. Um, sometimes now these days the, the correct term we use is special educational needs which can cover a multiplicity of, of issues, speech and language problems, learning difficulties, behavioral issues, and um, visual hearing or multisensory impairments, physical difficulties, um, and sometimes people on the autistic spectrum. So this lecture is, is really about a way in which professional applied kinesiology can provide a toolkit to, as one of my patients said, uh, you'll see her later talking about the experience with her child, kind of building blocks to a happier person, which I liked her analogy. Uh, and um, I'd like Dr. Mark Matthews just to stand on a minute because he's the man really that is behind putting all these different tools that we've gathered from AK and NLP and various things from our osteo back background. So Dr. Matthews, would you just stand up for a moment? If you really want to know about it, this is... This is uh, uh. So really we're talking about what Mark found and also what he founded because I've known Dr. Matthews now for many, many years, perhaps uh, I think I first met him when he was, before he was an osteopath, when he was involved in uh, uh, green early years of the issues around uh, uh, simple technologies to improve our world uh, when we didn't really understand the whole issue of climate change. And in a way he's been working ever since to put his ecological knowledge together more to bring the many facets, in this case, of the difficulties for children to, together. And, he, and about in 1995, I think, he founded this charity called the Sunflower Trust to facilitate and to fund the kind of care that he was putting together. And I got interested when I read some of his early papers. So this, it's called the Sunflower Trust because you have to have a name for a charity and uh, this, was, this is the charity, and there's a, there's a, um, there we are in Washington. There's Mark Matthews with some guy in the pub in Washington watching football. Um, and this was a paper that first interested me uh, in 1992, um, evaluating just a very small group of children with learning difficulties who were assessed by an educational psychologist. Um, and they were assessed before the program, and then a year later, and sample was compared with similar age group with comparative IQs who were assessed and reassessed over the same period. Um, so you had 10 and 10, and all 20 children involved were getting additional help uh, from special needs teachers. Um, and these are the summary of the findings that they found. You can see that not a big change in verbal IQ scores, although there were some, but a pretty impressive change in performance IQ scores. Um, so that was the start of saying, well, there's something here that AK, combined with all our other skills, combined with a bit of coaching and NLP help, um, can actually help these children physically to make them more neurologically balanced, 
make them healthier, and, when, and we know that healthier, well-integrated children and young people um, naturally feel better, perform better, achieve more, have more self-esteem, more self-confidence, and get on better with others and make most of their opportunities. So this is really what this whole uh, presentation is about. Um, of course, it's no substitute for special needs teaching, but it's a complement to it. So the series of assessments are designed to discover the gap in the working system, if you like, and remedy them so that each child can fulfill his or her potential for a healthy, happy, and fulfilled and useful life. Now, there's an array of specialists and skilled people who are able to help these children with special educational needs, but there is a little bit of confusion, certainly in England. Um, and the treatment can be expensive, it can be time consuming, and it can be fragmentary. Uh, you, take it to the, you take the children to the pediatrician, they go to an educational psychologist, have the WIS test to assess where the problems are, maybe they, they see various special uh, teachers and so on. But as Professor Margaret Snowden, who is a professor of psychology at York University in England and a specialist in this area, said, no one discipline um, has all the information necessary to provide uh, all the services needed for the learning disabled population. So, could it be that a multi-professional um, contribution, um, could it be if you had a large number of small-scale safe interventions, match them individually to each child's uh, specific needs, would it be effective? And this was the challenge that uh, Dr. Matthews set himself. So, we're going to go through the various phases of what we do and the philosophy behind it. Um, we're going to look at some of the work in the clinic Obviously, it's a big area, and I only have a short time to, to give you a feeling of it, a taste, if you like. So I've got a few little videos for you of what we're doing in the clinic, and I'm sure Dr. Matthews and I will be very happy to talk to you otherwise later on. So these are some of the basic AK concepts and principles underlying the program. You know them very well. The whole business of the functional neurology of the patient interconnects and integrates the structure, the physiology, and the mental emotional aspects, and the triad of health. Um, Sorry, a bit of a glitch here. And health is really a, a natural process that happens within the context of a relationship between the practitioner and, in this case, the child, and also the parent. Because in a way, what we're doing by treating the child with the parent in the room, we're giving the both of them an experience of where their difficulties are and how they interconnect one with another. Most people who have and it's usually something like dyslexia, dyspraxia, etc., are usually thinking very much only in terms of difficulties at school. And as we know, there's no correlation with intelligence. In fact, some of the most intelligent dyslexics uh, can be the most troublesome because they're the most frustrated. Um, so there's an accumulated unresolved stresses of different kinds are the source of many of the problems we see. So we experience feelings through our bodies, we're integrated holistic beings, and there's this whole idea of the weakest link, the concept that holding that each, really, each action is in a sequence, depends on the performance uh, of the action that it came before it. So if one isn't working, then all sorts of problems arise. And we're really just the humble servants of nature. Every patient is different, and we'll find their own way through the program. The program has a series of structures, and when we taught it, I think we've taught it to about 70 doctors in Germany over the years, and I think one of the things that came out of it for people in the AK community is that AK can be slightly confusing when you start, where how do I put all these things together? And by putting them together specifically in this way to help these children, um, and doing it in a sequence, but having the freedom to adapt to each child's needs as we go along, it also gave a sort of a side benefit was seeing how AK can be used in a sequence um, and putting all the different tools together in, in a certain way. You're familiar probably with uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitru Vitruvian Man model, which he felt maybe was a kind of working model for the universe. Well, the working of the universe of modern childhood is certainly in Europe and America 
is not that great anymore. And so it could look a bit more like this these days with all the screens, uh, uh, the overloading of sugary filled high carbohydrates diets, the pressures on parents, time constraints, etc. So these so-called diagnoses are really only descriptions. They're not an explanation. The autistic spectrum disorders, dyslexia, dyspraxia, uh, ADHD, um, they are really overlapping in many of these children. Um, you find that many children will have aspects of some of the others as well. So what happens to many of these children? Well, we know there was a study done in a Scottish young offenders uh, institution, uh, prison for young, young boys, some years ago, and they asked them, well, how many of these people do you think are dyslexic? And of course, they had no idea. We know that probably between 5 and 10 percent is the average in the population at large. Whereas in these boys who'd got into trouble with the law, it turned out that there were 50 percent of them had these learning difficulties. Um, so, they're often failing at school, they may be more susceptible for, for drug overuse, sometimes leading eventually to depression or even suicide. Maybe they become frustrated and become violent. And social or financial costs to the family and society can, if they really get into trouble and have to be, uh, end up in prison or something, it can cost uh, society a lot of money. Um, and they feel often left out and frustrated and maybe embittered that they are not understood. One in five children in the UK now have some kind of uh, specific learning difficulty, according to our government statistics. And it seems as if the problem is getting worse year on year. Well, why? I think the reasons are fairly complex. They obviously, there's a mixture of the environment and genetic factors, maybe the lifestyle, maybe the food that we're eating. Judging by the food I've been eating this week in Seoul, I think you have a lot healthier diet still. But I suspect, because I've also seen lots of fast food outlets in Seoul, I suspect that more and more people are being tempted to eat in the crazy uh, way that has been developed in America and Britain, where you don't have a very brain-friendly consumption of nutrients. So, but I also notice just about everybody on the subway is on their phone or on a screen, and we know that Korea is a highly uh, Wi-Fi uh, equipped country. It's great, and it's wonderful that you can get, get online everywhere, but there are maybe some downsides to spending all your time uh, on a screen. Um, so there are multifactorial problems, we know that. Is the problem getting worse? Uh, if so, why? Well, Maybe people are suffering from sleep deprivation. When I was here two years ago, I asked Dr. Lee, what are all these cars waiting for? And they said, well, it's, it's the uh, evening school cramming. The parents are waiting to pick their children up. It was 10 o'clock at night. Is that a great idea? It obviously produces some very brilliant people that you are here, but it's a tough for a child to be having to work very late and be under great pressure. Um, so education, maybe, but maybe some of these children while vaccinations have been a great innovation, there are problems. And uh, certainly in Britain and America, uh, you can't really discuss those problems about vaccination because uh, you're seen to be a, a crazy guy. Um, but for a small number of children, maybe they're getting exposed to too many vaccinations too early. Maybe that has an effect. We don't really know. Um, are there autoimmune problems, allergies, sensitivities? Um, when that child's system gets overloaded uh, and breaks down, uh, that may be part of the problem. And certainly they seem to be suffering from some kind of neurological confusions, uh, developmental delays. Often they have some kind of autoimmune problems. Um, and it's often coupled with some kind of attention difficulty, behavior problems, learning difficulties. So, I wanted to share this with you, and I've done so in other, other meetings, because I think AK doctors of various uh, backgrounds have something to offer, and I think what, what uh, Dr. Matthews put together is um, an interesting and useful tool to put a lot of things together and start to treat the whole of the triangle of health of these children. Now, 
You'll see this boy later on, uh, and just have a look at him there. This is uh, him, and, and you see we're working always, usually with the mother, sometimes with the father in the room. And uh, um, this is one of the mothers of one of my boys. And just Me to take you. boys, and just Me to take you to you was a variety of just sort of strange um, behaviours really that were slightly off from the usual. He was showing there was an excess of energy. He would chance backwards and forwards endlessly, always with a stick, no purpose as far as I could see. He um, paid no attention to his peers. Didn't, uh, they didn't register. He was not interested in them at all. Easily frustrated. Um, and he, he would uh, scream and he would hit himself and bang his head in frustration. Lots of, sort of I hate myself, um, self-loathing going on. So I took him to you thinking I, would, I was after sort of a human MOT, mm. if you like. Mm. An MOT is an is, is a acronym from England uh, actually referring to when you have to take your car in to check whether the brakes work and the lights work after it's three years old. But uh, she is really meaning, what is wrong? What, what's going on with this boy? And you notice that self, low self-esteem, you can't really have good intelligence and find that your, the school system is impenetrable without affecting your sense of self. And if your sense of self starts to become damaged when you're too young to understand what's happening to yourself, then it has profound impacts to what you can do later on. In another context, I used to uh, do work with uh, an American uh, NLP type of guy where we used to do fire walking. And this is an interesting thing to do if you've ever walked across hot coals. It's a stupid thing to do in one sense, but actually human beings can do walking across hot coals. But it's a useful analogy about breaking your belief about what you can and can't do. And you could see people having this experience and, and their brain is saying, oh, I thought I couldn't do that, and now I find that I can. And it starts to repattern everything. So if you've been experiencing all the time that you're very usually just as intelligent as your peers, but for some reason it's when you try to read the pictures, the, the, the letters seem to move around, you don't seem to succeed at certain things at school, then it's not surprising that so many of these children start to build a sense of self-belief which is in somewhat limited and damaging. And then they start to give up. And as you know, one way of not failing is to not engage in the first place. So one technique that many of these children do is to withdraw. No, don't try and then you don't fail. But as we know, it's only through life's failures that we learn. So that compounds the problem. So everyone's different and everyone's unique and everyone's special. Everyone does the best they can with what they know. And this is our belief that everyone inside is perfect. So labels just describe symptoms. They're not the problem, the disease, or the reason in this case. We're basically treating people, not really symptoms, but sometimes we forget that. Um, and in a way, you can, you, what AK teaches us is that at some level, everyone knows exactly what's wrong with them. But they don't always know consciously what can be done to help, and they don't know it, how, how to deal with it. So, what AK gives us is a sort of another handle on tapping in to this understanding that their, their unconscious mind knows. So what we're really doing is trying to interact with that innate genius that we all have and these children all have in measurable, objective ways that, that enable the body to, to express and act out uh, specifically what's going on. Now there's, there's, there's seldom one single problem that can be named. Rather, there's a unique combination of problems. Um, and in this case, when we're treating them, the sort of diagnosis and treatment is going hand in hand. And as Dr. Protelli was mentioning, this is a nice analogy that I've uh, acquired, that genetics in our life kind of load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. And so, it's usually a combination of these two factors. So, how does this whole process work? Well, 
you're familiar with the triad of health, and this is the basis of what we're going to look at. But usually, these children are exposed to professionals who are specialists in one or other of those triangles, and that's excellent, um, because we don't have all those skills. But what we do have is an ability to, to look at all these sides and move them forward step by step, um, so that all sides of the triangle are starting to function a little bit better. So you can look at it another way as a triangle starting at the bottom here. Um, where is the pointer here? With the hardware, if you like. And this is where the manual medicine comes in, um, looking to see whether all the functional mechanisms are working efficiently. And we, before we see them, we gather quite a lot of data uh, from the parents and also from our assessments. We spend upwards of an hour testing these children uh, in a whole range. I don't have time to go through it all, but looking at the three sides of the triangle with various assessments to see where they are. Um, we look at all sorts of forms, and we do, we do an assessment and see where they come out. Um, so we're looking at this pre-screening questionnaire, the initial consultation, and the assessment and the scoring, and then we report the findings to the parent, and we see whether they're suitable and whether we think we can help them. And there are obviously three areas we think we can change, musculoskeletal, neurological, and the biochemical side. And we give them a score. So, we usually start with the structure. Right? Because this is the way, this is partly because this Mark and I are both uh, osteopaths, so this is where is our home ground. But also, particularly for many of these children, it's an area that hasn't often been looked at. Why would you think your muscles had anything to do with your ability to attend and sit still or, or do things or be organized in school? But particularly with some of these children, but want more with the dyspraxic element, when you start to go through all their muscles, you find that maybe a couple of dozen muscles, major muscles in their body, are not really switching on, so, or they're hypertonic, or, or whatever. And so they, they have many structural uh, issues to overcome. We then look at the neurology to evaluate the reflexes, which relate to fine coordination and balance and uh, regulate information and storage and, and retrieval and so on. Um, we then later on come and look at the nutrition. Our brains, as we know, are 60% fat, but we need those essential fatty acids to run our brain and all the cofactors and so on. We'll come on to that in a minute. So we're looking at neurotransmitter activity, glands, organs, liver detoxification, respiratory systems, autoimmune systems, gastrointestinal system, inflammatory pathways, allergies, and other systems. And we treat through the diet where we can and where supplements and homeopathy also can assist, if necessary. And we use some simple neurolinguistic programming techniques um, to assist the child to establish a positive attitude and approach. Because as I said earlier, one of the biggest things is their sense of self. So we're trying to help them find a new sense of self-confidence that enables them to, to more readily access the resources that they have with dealing with these challenges. So we start with the structure. And in a way, a lot of Mark is very good, I think, at using analogies for them so they can understand. It's no use talking our language to an eight-year-old child. So you have to give them metaphors. Um, and so we're saying we're, we're trying to get the car on the road. You take your car to the garage, you have to get it fixed. So the first part is getting that structure side, getting the car on the road. Here's one of the little boys. This is the first time that I'd seen him. And you can see, and you can see, um, you can see from his structure already the stress and the dysfunction that there is in his body. Um, you can see how he's standing. You can look at the angle of his shoulders. Uh, you can look at his uh, protruding scapula, which often seems to be a factor in these children. Weak serratus anterior often. Strain in his pelvis and spine and so on. We put them through um, a structural analysis and we show it to the parent because often the parents haven't really looked at that in the same way. And so it's starting to give the mother or the father a kind of, ah, so you think this has got something to do with that. That's interesting. 
So, stage one is often the structure, integration of muscles and adaptation, assessment and treatment of the alignment and functional integrity of the musculoskeletal system. So we're looking to see that all those muscles are turning on and off as they should do, and the body is adapted to different positions like lying, sitting, standing, and walking. So here's Mary, and here we are assessing all the major muscles, in this case, in her shoulder. And this has a useful diagnostic tool from our point of view, but it also has a profound tool in terms of making the relationship. As we said, healing occurs always in relationship, one person and another. And by having this initial assessment, it gives us a chance to mix our energies with them, to, for them to begin to be confident of us. And she was quite happy on the table, but some of these children have learned to defend themselves against the world. So to start with, they're not very happy, they're not very friendly. Frankly, they're difficult. They're not your nice, easy Mrs. Fufupnik who's got a sciatic problem, as George would say. They are challenging. So we need that time to start with to be able to build that relationship and build that sense of trust so we can lead them forward um, in the future. So often they're gross and subtle biomechanical dysfunctions and uh, we have to uh, deal with them. and speed up a bit because I've got a lot to say. So we're looking at the operating systems, uh, we're looking at assessment of fine reflex controls relating to balance, coordination, gait, information input, as we mentioned this. Looking at the cranium here, we're just doing another little adjustment here, here with this this girl. Yes, there's a, a strain within the back. So she's, got a, she's got an intraosseous strain in her mandible. Um, we're not only treating the problem, but we're teaching the, the mother that all these things could be having some impact on that child, which is usually um, news to them. They know that child is struggling, they know they're sometimes having difficulty, maybe, maybe they're uncoordinated and so on, but this is starting to give them much greater sense of how and why. So we give them cross-crawl exercises depending on their ability. Um, we use different poetry to start to get them to, to use and coordinate their bodies in different ways. Uh, we have a lot of um, information for the parents. We have uh, each stage the parents get homework and guidance. And, and basically the, the safer you can make the child feel, the more you can challenge them. Okay? Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So we look at this, the software, we're clearing negative associations, we'll see in a bit. Um, so the third stage, we're looking at these left brain integration processes and a series of challenges which sets the various activities relating to reading, writing, and numeracy, and memory recall, and so on. This is something taken from Carl Ferreri, um, and uh, this is where if you take almost anybody who is dyslexic and has had trouble with writing and put a pen in their writing hand, they'll go weak all over. And usually if you find the beginning or end points of that meridian that's involved, that will strengthen them. And this has a double effect. Not only are we correcting some glitch in the system, probably when we were little, we're learning to, to write and having a difficulty, and we clock that difficulty, we, we become aware of it, and at some level in our brain, it's like a virus on the hard disk of the computer. We are still aware, at an unconscious level, that holding the pen makes us less able to deal with things. This is a little girl brought in by her grandmother. She no longer has a father on the scene and her mother has some psychiatric problems and her grandmother was looking after her. Not easy when you're a grandmother. 
Now, we also use various tools, as I say, this is something from the NLP world, which is called the, the spelling strategy. Most good spellers, I don't know how it is in Korean, and this doesn't really work out very well for you in the Korean language, but in English we take a long word like concentration, um, and we break it up because good spellers tend to have a visual recall strategy. They can see the words in their mind's eye, and they can recall it as a picture. Whereas people who are not so good spelling, maybe they have to get it in their body, a physiological movement, or they have an auditory strategy. And as some of you know, English is not so easy because we don't always spell the words as they sound. So about 40% of English is written completely differently from how you might expect the sound to come. So here, you'll see this girl, she is not seeing that word written up on an actual piece of paper. What we're trying to do is give her a chance to remember it on an imaginary piece of paper in her mind's eye. But in the picture, in the film, you'll see it almost looks as if she's reading it. And that's what we're trying to get her to do, to, to remember and make a picture of it and recall it and spell it. So I'm getting her to read the word backwards. doing two things or three things at once. We're doing a process teaching her a tool that if she can build a visual picture, so that, that spelling, which often she has, they have difficulties, uh, will be helpful. We know from uh, research in, into the spelling strategy that it usually improves people's spelling if they apply it by about 15 to 20 percent. But we're also giving her an experience of success. And this is one thing many of these children have not had a lot of. So you'll see, in a way, what Mark has quite rightly said, our clinic is a theatre. There's a show going on. You know, you can go in every day and you can hear Shakespeare's Hamlet. And every night it's slightly different. The actors are saying the same words, but it's a different experience and it's a different audience. And so these children ha are being put through the emotional roller coaster that you would have if you go to the theatre. They're experiencing, and you notice I'm giving her lots of praise and lots of, uh, of uh, encouragement to give her that experience because it's something they're usually starving for and don't have a lot of. So this is the mental side of the triangle. We're taking them up, if you like, a stairway of things that they need to be able to do uh, at school, to read, to write, and so on. So our job really as clinicians is to see all this shut downness that they come into us with and not really believe it and see what their potential is um, and help clear some of the things that are in the way and stopping them feel good about themselves, stopping them feeling they can do something and giving them the tools and turning on their body and giving them the food to run their brains so not only can they function better and take advantage of the teaching that may be special needs teaching that if they're lucky enough to get, but also that we're changing their beliefs all right? And a belief is a very powerful sense of something. You believe something to be true, very often it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you can do something, quite often you end up being able to do it. Now, you can't fly, so don't think you can jump off a roof and fly, but in many ways in life, uh, it's what we believe that either uh, enables us to go ahead and try something, and maybe we have some mistakes along the way, and we learn from those mistakes, and gradually we can do something, or if we believe we can't do it, we never engage, and so we never have that learning experience that comes from the successes and the failures along the way. So parents and children are asked to complete a list of situations and events and issues that the children have difficult, and we call these negative tapes. Well, nobody uses tapes anymore. <laughs> you could call them negative MP3 units or whatever you want to call them, but 
there are loops that we run in our minds that say, oh, I can't do this, I'm no good at that, oh, I don't like my sister or brother, whatever. And we try and change those negative loops. See if we can run this one. She's writing her name down. A name, your name really is a symbol for who you are, your identity. Her name is Sky, and she goes weak when she writes her name. Not if she uses my name. <laughs> She's already caught on. So I'm telling her there's nobody else quite like her, that she, as her grandmother, as I am, we're all unique. We're all perfect as we are. Probably never will be. You're what we call completely and utterly, and there's a word for it, it's, it's unique. You probably don't know that, but you, do you know? It means very special, so special that there's never been anyone just else quite like you. All right? Now, the thing is, there's never been anyone else quite like Granny Hunter. Or even me. And we're finding the beginning and end point which strengthens her and we're treating that again. And so um, we're eliminating, we're trying to eliminate these negative uh, issues or tapes if you like and we're processing, uh, eliminating them and then helping them to construct a more positive responses. So the important distinguish in life is between behaviour, sorry th these words have got broken up somehow, um, and identity. And very often in school, if you're a naughty boy or a naughty girl, you start to get told off, naturally. Teachers have got lots of children, it's really difficult for them. I used to be a teacher, I know. But you start to then carry over the criticism you have for your behaviour and you attach it to your identity. And this is one of the most damaging things because then once your identity is tainted with the negative, it's very difficult. Um, to let cut out of your unconscious mind that somehow you, you perfect you, are in some way uh, not good enough. So, it's about empowerment. Um, and we're showing the child how to habituate their own innate abilities and respond more effectively in ways that empower them. So, here's our mother again. Once we started on this mental journey, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but that was, that was really quite extraordinary. So once we started on the mental journey, as she called it, she felt, in this case, you never quite know with the children. Different parts of the, of the, of the triangle of health will be the most powerful one for those children. And each sequence of little events, by just fixing the fact that you go weak every time you say or think of your name, or you hold a pen in your hand, how much does that impact? Probably a little bit, but maybe not hugely, but if you stack them, lots and lots and lots and lots of these little bits, you, got, you start to get some significant change. So, we're balancing the, the neurobiochemical pathways, uh, we're assessing them relating to these neurotransmitters, balancing the nervous system, here we're going up the triangle, if you like, to uh, the software, the functions, and so on, um, and we're looking at the biochemistry. And often, that Vitruvian man that we saw from, from Leonardo is turning more into uh, something like this. Um, and we know from the effects of food and behavior and health, and we know also from our AK experience and the whole field of functional medicine how impactful uh, nutrition and the right diet can be and how difficult it sometimes can be to get children to eat a healthy diet. Um, there's quite a lot of work in the UK um, especially in, in my town, Oxford, 
on essential fatty acids and their influence on learning and behavior, um, mounting interest in the role of these fats. Um, but the only trouble is, this is a piece from one of our national papers, uh, The Telegraph, and typically what happens is the magic bullet kind of idea tends to evolve. It's all omega-3s, or it's all this or all that. And as we know, life's a bit more complicated. They are important. Um, and research at Oxford University Department of Social Policy and Intervention has done some interesting studies. Um, average levels of omega-3 fats are very low in most Western diets. I suspect in Korea they're maybe better. You eat quite a lot of fish, perhaps, and you also eat a healthier diet with more probiotic content from kimchi, etc. But as soon as you start to adapt to the so-called sad American diet, the standard American or British diet, then those levels will start to go down. And um, previous research has shown that increasing children's dietary intake of those, those fatty acids can improve their concentration, reduce disruptive behavior, boost reading and spelling progress. Um, this is a study um, done by uh, Alex Richardson, who I know, and her team showing big changes. And you'll notice the biggest change uh, are in the poorest uh, children, the 10% uh, of the worst readers. So it doesn't happen for every child, but for the ones who are often having most difficulty, or have most difficulty processing these fatty acids, the, the big changes occur. So whether it's EPA or DHA, there's a big influence. Uppers and downs we will have, and this is our kind of uh, high fructose corn syrup, extra mercury diet that some of us are consuming. So um, we're going to have to speed up, but we're looking at all these biochemical pathways, looking at the fuel we put in. Um, I've got just too much to talk about, really. Uh, we're trying to get fuel in the tank, get the glands and organs and relationships sorted out, um, assessing their tissues have all the right ingredients, conditions need to support their hormones, enzymes, looking at deficiencies, looking at inflammation pathways, neurotransmitters, looking at their... Often many of these children have sort of allergies or, or skin issues, etc., etc. Maybe they have some dysbiosis with bacterial, viral, fungal problems, toxins, a toxic overload. Uh, we're trying to deal with those. We're reinforcing uh, positive emotional changes using simple NLP interventions that you've seen um, and trying to build that change, that attitudinal change. They have, um, this enables them to take more responsibility and enjoy handling challenges more effectively. Here's another part from our mum. No, no, it was not a mysterious journey. It did, it, it was sort of, building blocks, isn't yeah. it, where you built a yeah. sort of happier person in the mm -hmm. end. Um, there was, I think, in the middle, um, where he was also, he, he enjoyed the attention, mm -hmm. but at that point his interest started sort of dipping, yeah. and it became that bit harder to do the exercises at home and to... Yeah. Um, How long do I have? I wouldn't say that I, I thought it was a waste of time, by any means, but it did get harder yeah. at that time. So, here we are making the journey. And sometimes what you're helping also is the parent to see with new eyes so their parenting skills can adapt. Um, and maybe you're encouraging them rather than to send the child to bed and they don't sleep, maybe they should give them a better food to help them sleep, have a quieter period and maybe read them a story and so on and so forth so their sleep pattern may be improving. Um, so state management, life skill management, combination of therapeutic techniques to create these conditions physical, neurological, biochemical. So, I'm going to have to speed through this because I want to get through everything. It doesn't really translate into Korean, but an incantation is something you repeat to yourself. And most of us may have things that we're unconsciously saying, you know, I can't do this, I'm no good at that, all right? But <clears throat> it often turns out to be an incantation, something, I can't do this, I can't do that. So we're trying to help them change so that they start to believe that they can do things. I'm sorry, it doesn't really work in translation. Um, so we're looking at these different stages. So here we are, so they're ready to take off. And this is Magnus, uh, the mother who you saw talking. This is her son, who is on the autistic spectrum. Um, and here she is talking about the challenge. 
thinking about the challenges. The biggest change is his interest in other people. That's the biggest one. And the one that also worried me the most to a certain extent. Yes, it was actually, because going through life not being interested in people around you is not good. That's <laughs> right. So, so yeah. well, yes, yeah. and, and he is really, he still prefers his own company. I think maybe that's what he's like. Yeah. But mm -hmm. he's eight, nothing is set in stone. No. Anything can change. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to tell you one thing he, he, he told me, because I, I asked him, do you feel anything has changed mm -hmm. since we stopped mm -hmm. going to Clyde? And he immediately said, no, not at all, nothing. And then he thought, just a brief second, he said, well, is that when I wake up in the morning, I think it's going to be a really bad day. But it, it's always really nice. <laughs> and I, I think, well, that's lovely. Yes, I couldn't have won. So, a bad day that always turns out really nice. That's not a bad outcome, is it? Um, so here we are, we're getting them ready so that they are more able to take advantage of those remedial teaching and educational experiences that they are hopefully getting. And at each stage, we have these different homeworks and sheets and so on for the parents, so, which we don't have time to go into all that. So, going right up to the point where they're having a new experience of what their identity is, who they are, what their purpose in life is, and what their goals are, etc. So we then screen them before and afterwards, and, well, what's the evidence we're making any difference? Now, you can imagine, it's one thing to test one nutritional change. You can give a hundred children a placebo, and another hundred or thousand or ten thousand children an essential fatty acid, and a, a year later see whether their reading scores have changed. But we're putting them through so many different changes, it's a challenge. So it's a kind of black box. You see what they are before they go into the black box, and you see what they are as they come out. So that's where we're doing and trying to address some of these problems to research this. Um, the Sunflower Trust is a charity that's trying to fund uh, the treatment for families that don't have the funds, and also some of the research. But it's not always easy. Um, Anyway, I'm going to zoom through. Um, we know that there are research challenges in AK and a small charity like the Trust. And we know that, okay, they're not laboratory studies, they're not representing these samples. The sample sizes are too small to draw any really meaningful conclusions. And the conditions of screening are not necessarily exactly the same. And the recruitment tends to be random. Um, and because of the individual each child, um, it's difficult to say that the, the research is uh, 100%. But what's happening in the UK, I don't know if it's happening in, in Korea, but the patient reported outcomes is, uh, in clinical trials is starting to become a useful measure. So in a way you could say what better measure of values is what the patients or the parents, the families think themselves and what they notice. So these are new tools, PROMS, uh, have been developed and are coming forward in the National Health Service in the UK. And this is perhaps a way forward to, to assess it. Um, so, I'm going to whip through this. So this is the sort of statements you often hear. This is, he's always struggling at school, and they have said they think he's dyslexic. Continue tells us he's stupid and bottom of the class. He's so, and then the, now what we get, these are actual quotes from the parents of this boy. He's much more confident now. He actually tries new things and can do them. Um, he's gone up several levels at school and been taken off all of his one-time uh, one -time teaching assistants because his confidence has now grown so much better. So, um, you see a 51 improvement overall, 51%. We measure them in the different areas of the changes um, after nine months. Uh, and these are some of the kind of breakdowns. You can see big changes here, the musculoskeletal, uh, significant ones in other areas, but uh, here's more assessments of different areas. We've broken them down into different sort of areas. Uh, this is his overall improvement um, of 40% on, from his baseline score. Um, but as I say, there's several times it's not one single problem. And what we're trying to do is we're working them up this sort of triangle of steps, which you can read a bit more later on, up to this whole business of their identity and the changes that they can take. So. We're looking at the neurology, the biochemistry, the emotions. We're looking at the stresses, their difficulties at school, reading, and so on. We're looking at um, visual, eye, hand skill coordination, concentration, health, stamina, confidence, attitude. Uh, we do the research mainly through questionnaires and follow-up questionnaires and the parents' and teachers' reports. 
and um, looking at all of these data clusters. I've got too many of these to show you, but um, we're looking at uh, areas like balance mechanisms and so on, uh, structural alignment. You see the changes in these cluster scores afterwards. The osteopathic chiropractic patterns of, of structural impairment, um, often adrenal stress. Often these little children, of quite young children, are already showing quite significant signs of stress, as who wouldn't be? if they're struggling with this. And so taking that load off their young adrenal system can be an important part of the strange. And their autoimmune indicators, primitive reflexes are often still present. Something like the Moro or the startle reflex is still there when we start off and usually that quietens down and disappears. Looking at fatty acid metabolism changing, well, we talked about that a lot. Sugar handling uh, in the UK, uh, sugar is extremely cheap and is, is everywhere. Uh, if you look down the average supermarket, there's a whole aisle of sugary drinks. I don't know who's drinking it, because I'm not, but somebody is. And of course, we know that has possibly a profound effect. And in, in the UK now, we're trying to get action on the government to say, look, sugar is the next tobacco. We're starting to eradicate tobacco as, a, as a, a, um, uh, an acceptable um, activity, but of course food is a more difficult thing to change because everybody has to eat. Um, we're integrating movement, coordination and so on and we do these cluster analysis to see where the outcomes are. And generally speaking there are some good changes. And we've broken them down, I've broken these down into these different sort of issues and you can see that um, before they had high score for depression, anxiety, etc. And afterwards that score has dropped, in his case, by 20%. Here's a big one, very high scores for difficulty, low self-esteem, which uh, now has dropped down markedly. Um, so these are the kinds of changes. I don't really have time to go into this case, but there's an, another case. Uh, it's always good to, it's nice to share our most successes, and this is a case where a boy didn't really change that much on score, but we did see some changes later on. Uh, I'm sorry not to have enough time to give you this, um, that the changes were reported, while the indicators didn't change dramatically straight away. Later on, some different, did, there were big changes. I know I want to get time for questions, so we'll whisk through this. Um, so here's the girl, a proud holder of her champion sticker. You can see uh, on her chest here and her little certificate at the end. So she's got a sense of achievement. She's probably a girl who never gets prizes and never gets certificates. I know for our adult brain, it seems rather pathetic, but for an eight-year-old brain to get that sticker and get that certificate, it's a big change. It's something you can be proud of and show your grandma and, and you can look at her face. So. Improve concentration, improve confidence, taking more responsibility, improving timekeeping, improving short-term memory. These are kind of changes. Reduction in anger when something goes wrong. And what does it cost? Well, the bursary is usually about a thousand pounds, which I think is about one million six hundred uh, won, but I'm not quite sure about that. But about a thousand pounds covers for going through this process. Usually lasts ideally slowly over about nine months, coming maybe once every three or four weeks. <coughs> Uh, and that's the sort of change. But you have, who knows where your interventions will lead. Remember this was Tim we saw earlier? Here he is, not a million miles away from here in China, just to our east, on top of a mountain there, um, just before he goes to university. And this is a card, a postcard I got from him, out of the blue, some la last year. Dear Clive, it's been a while since I lay on your office bed here. Uh, here I am now teaching English and learning Mandarin in China before I go to university. I'm with my buddy Alex on top of Mount Taishan. Thank you for the magic you worked on me all those years ago. <coughs> here is where I am because of it. Well, that touches my heart. It makes life and hard work and makes all that struggle with these children who don't want to do anything difficult, thank you, um, to deal with. So there's Tim there and here he is here. So, it's not too late to have a happy childhood. Um, change. Uh, we can change lives with AK. All right. 
and um, we can go from this despondency uh, to his achievement. Here he is showing the cup he won at school, a proud, uh, a proud little boy. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Clive. Any questions? Hi, hi Clive. Um, when you do the treatment with the B and E point, you have to also tap the GV20 yep. at the same time? Correct, yeah. For, for both the, the, of those? The GV20 and the B and points, that seems to be enough. Okay. Um, and tapping is so much better for these children sticking needles in that usually they're a bit phobic about that. And tapping is fine. Right. And, it usually, and you can test it and it, change, it changes. So, yeah, GV20 and whatever B and E point you find. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I need a headphone? Hold on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 네, 좋은 강의 감사합니다. 어, 학습이랑 언어에 대해서 많은 말씀을 해주셔서 감사드리고요. 스트레스나 NLP 같은 경우에 AK를 이용해서 진단을 할때 주로 언어나 법화를 사용해서 환자를 그 진단을 하게 되지 않습니까? 근데 어, 만약에 그 검사하는 사람의 언어를 이 검사 받는 사람이 이해하지 못할 때, 그러니까 언어가 다를 경우에 만약에 박사님이 한국 아이를 스트레스를 진단하기 위해서 영어로 하는데 얘는 못 알아들을 때 그때 그 근육 테스트는 어, 그 신뢰할 수 있는 건지 그거에 대해 관해서 한번 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 가령 만약에 우리가 아프리카에 가서 아프리카 아이를 이 사람을 진단을 하고 싶은데 그게 가능한 건지 한번 여쭤보고 싶습니다. Yeah, well, very good question. Thank you for that. Um, uh, well. The experience I have of teaching in Germany is that uh, providing that you have the parent or, or, so, or another clinician there who can translate, um, then it works fine. I was a bit concerned when I started to um, demonstrate this with German children um, in the courses that we ran in Germany for many years, that it would be really, really difficult. It's more difficult because you don't have that ease to make them at ease. You can't share jokes with them, for example, and so on. But my experience working between, and I don't speak very good German, so I had to do it mostly in English, although I learned a few key words as I went along, is that it is possible. But it's a very good question, yeah. And so with the AK, you have something kind of static to measure. Uh, and so it still works. But you do have to get them to use their own language. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yeah, 박사님 강의 중에 어, 박사님 강의 중에 백신을 언급하셨는데 어, 영국은 그 웨이크필드라든가 그다음에 이, 이탈리아에서도 그 백신이 어, 어티즘의 원인이 된다는 판결이 나온 걸로 알고 있습니다. 그, 그 진료 중에 어, 본인 개인적이나 아니면 다른 AK 의사님들이 그런 백신을 우려하는 어, 그런 관점에서 어, 마치 미국의 이제 밥 시얼스라는 소아과 의사처럼 좀, 좀 달라진 백신 스케줄을 권하든지 아니면 다른 방법을 어떻게 부모들한테 제안하는지 그런 걸 알고 싶습니다. Yeah, uh, good question. Highly controversial subject in the UK and in, in America. Even more so in America, where children are almost legally required to have all vaccinations, all, all children, the standard, no change. And most children will be fine, of course. And I'm not against vaccinations in their entirety, but it is my subjective experience that some sensitive children, for various reasons, it, uh, that a barrage of vaccinations early on may be a challenge. And, uh, and we, you mentioned Dr. Wakefield and the trouble that he had in the UK uh, and the controversy there is there. I don't, in this time, want to get into it because it's a huge subject. Um, but uh, there was at that time when the MRI issue became many parents who were looking to see whether could they have single vaccinations rather than multiple ones. 
and it's a highly contentious issue, which maybe we can discuss personally afterwards. It's too, too big a subject. But I don't have the evidence, but I suspect that these children, not only vaccination, but all sorts of things that happens to them, they are, they are a, a, a small section, and these difficult things, they just don't cope with them so well as the more robust children, and so it may be one factor. But I don't have a huge amount of evidence, I just have a suspicion. Right? But a lot of people have that suspicion, and a lot of parents do too, uh, but it's one of those areas of great controversy. So um, we'll have a discussion later on. <laughs> Any other questions? I believe we will have one more, uh, that, but we are just to your left. Oh. <laughs> 예, 그 중간에 스테이지별로 그 페런트 가이드라인이랑 홈워크 핸드아웃이 있는데 어떤 그 스테이지별로 어, 어떤 것들을 좀 <웃음> 내용이 들어가 있는지 좀알수 있을까요? Um, but yes, we are, we are doing it in stages, and as I said, we, we give them metaphors, we're getting the car on the road, we're working on the computer, etc. We use those kind of simple languages for the children, um, and we are working through, in different ways, those different areas of the triangle of health, because these children always have aspects of challenges in all three sides, and as we said, they may come in uh, with what you could call uh, the mental side or the, you know, the, the, the inability to learn, which you might think of that, but usually they have structural issues and they have biochemical issues as well, and we have to work on them together. Some of these children, we may have to intervene at the biochemical one very early in order to get them functioning. But do you have access? Well, um, the Sunflower Trust has various things. You can go on the website and see those, and we can certainly talk to you afterwards. But the, I think those handouts are for more for the parents, and it doesn't really work unless you know how to deliver them and so on. But uh, I'm sure we can talk later on and, and, and uh, give you any sort of advice. But uh, as far as the clinician is concerned, we really need to have good AK doctors who we can then train in the process uh, because it's on top of having a good experience in AK. And that's really how it works best. Because it's a different thing to treat more small children like this than to treat maybe the adults, if you're used to treating adults, who are cooperative, happy to be treated. Some of these children don't want to be there, and they're cantankerous, and they're all screwed up, and it's quite a challenge. We know some people we've trained who didn't want to carry on because it's, it's too much of a challenge. So the kind of handouts we have are just things to help the parents between each time. Sometimes, for example, we mention the negative tapes, trying to pull up some of those negative things so we can help them change them. So that's where we get the parent. Or maybe getting them to do exercises at home, or getting them to drink some water rather than Coca-Cola, or getting them to sleep, etc., etc. 